trust, basically, with that. I mean, I had been to, I had filmed at climate camps before and stuff, but I think it was just suddenly the filming that I had been doing that everybody had been treating like, oh God, you know, this hassle, and oh, she's here, she is again, and, 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 and then suddenly it was valuable and useful, and they wanted it, and they wanted that material, and they were really glad that I had been there, and they were really excited about going of it, and so I think that kind of, these little things kind of help to reposition the prospect in people's mind and stuff. Um, and just being ridiculously stubborn and persistent. Well, I mean, it's amazing, amazing um, whistle stop tour you've done there, kind of the setup, because it brings out so many of the key issues, of course, the nature of a, a necessary community around legal support, you know, all sorts of support, both in front of and behind the camera. That idea of persistence, which is absolutely crucial. And the way you described um, the making of the, of the film, the, the, the treatment of the images, if you like, the, the safe houses and so on, is something we would equate much more with, say, Burma, the film's coming out, and a film like BJ Burma coming out of, you know, explicitly dictatorship and so on. But of course, very much similar here, with, you know, different legal structure in place altogether. Um, and a very different sense of the relationship, of course, um, perhaps, say, Andrea, um, to how you deal with, with this, this mass of people and how you negotiate your own filmmaking through that. The film itself, you know, if you have a chance to see the clip, we'll, we'll remind you out of the trailer, but the film itself, of course, and your making of it comes up against, directly up against the authorities on several occasions where your, your press status, if you like, is completely ignored and acted, mm. you know, um, discarded. Um, but Andrea, I wonder if we could think, is, is this a good time to speak to you while you're still doing it? <laughs> Let's go to Manu. Should we go to Manu? Okay. Manu, um, the, the idea that Emily raised about making something visible, of course, you started with what was already visible, you know, the, the CCTV footage gathered across the city by all these millions of cameras. You then sought, as you said in your introduction, to, to access this, this, um, this imagery and make the film exclusively from what was available. The process, which took many years, had many setbacks. And film footage wasn't, wasn't recorded in certain cases. It was inaccessible, it had been lost and deleted and so on. But behind this idea of sourcing exclusively from public imagery that, in a sense, was privatised, what was your key intention in relationship to this law? What was, your, what was your, the hope that you, you sought to kind of embody in the film in relation to these existing images? Um, OK, the key intention that spans the course of my work is to demystify technology. Um, like not celebrate it and say, look how magic, and it resolves all our problems, um, but to actually demystify it or deconstruct it and um, just lay open the workings behind the hard shell. So in the case of uh, CCTV and the Data Protection Act, um, um, yeah, really, I called it a legal ready-made because uh, the law was the, the primary uh, means of production. <laughs> Um, those um, images uh, were brought out of, of uh, an inaccessible archive to the public through the Data Protection Act. Mm. Um, and again, it was to lay open the, um, yeah, the, the, the process um, by what we believe um, what is an equilibrium behind those who are running the CCTV systems and those who are being affected by being filmed. So, um, some have, yeah, you have the right to collect images, but then you have also some, some duties and how do people go about that. And the project really showed uh, that um, there's still much to wish for and that we shouldn't feel too comfortable about that technology just because we are employing it in a, you know, in a democracy as opposed to other situations like Beijing is under CCTV since the Olympic Games and um, yeah, London will also get an upgrade <laughs> um, until next year. And, um, yeah, so um, really alongside the film, I published quite a lot about the process and about all the things which I couldn't pack into the film, since the film has the format of a, a science fiction story, and I didn't want to turn it into a piece of, I don't know, into a didactic piece, basically, by packing all my first-hand experience into it. Um, I think we've got an image now. Are we ready to go? Well, they took the DVD um, of our two films <laughs> <laughs> and the Joking. computer. <laughs> I took away. I'm not joking. I mean, we could. So we have months. Um, oh, they're back. They're back. Um, Do you have the DVD which was in the other computer? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so while the DVD returns, should we let's watch mine? No, we'll come back to you. We're going to hit the line. 
Uh, yeah, we'll hit the lights, I think, unless they're centrally controlled somewhere in Berlin. Uh, um, very possibly, actually, by, by Quaker Central. Um, <laughs> no? Oh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They go up and then they come down, maybe. I have no idea. Okay, let's ask about the lights. We're going to get them. That's all right. Okay, so we'll watch this and then we'll come back to the DVD. We'll put it on this. Sound. Or sound. I mean, it's not going to be in sound. No, there isn't have to be sound. Um, so every customer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> when there's subtitles. <laughs> 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 there's, there's a thing. 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 Mac compatible USB stick, <laughs> um, but yeah, it uh, it shows um, how I uh, source uh, locations for CCTV filmmaking, but it was produced much later than um, yeah after Faceless was already uh, launched. There's also an aspect in it which uh, shows this crossover of networks and, and moving image I'm interested in. I'm using a little device to get into the wireless signal of a wireless CCTV camera. Um, a practice which um, uh, is uh, illegal under the telecommunications law. You're not allowed to intercept other people's data. However, I feel that technology is actually uh, bringing insecurities with it. People don't know that they are transmitting uh, unencrypted signals and that any passerby can actually intercept them. So, do you mind stopping it? Because it's a bit pointless. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry about this. Um, so, yeah, so this type of interception is not only possible in the case of CCTV but also baby phones. So, if you walk down the street with that device, you know, you can look into people, into baby cribs. And, it's a bit spooky, yeah. So I guess um, at the long uh, view, that's one of the uh, yeah the messages <laughs> um, that actually all these security technologies are also introducing new insecurities about data handling, yeah, about maintenance. So, yeah, no, thank you, thank you. I mean, it's, um, it seems to me, Andre, that your film, in a way, sits between Emily's and Manu's, not least because you have a public individual, but he's an individual that you've followed for many years, who is both private and also, at certain moments, explosively public. And so the nature of the image making that you're, you're pursuing is, is kind of somewhere on that interface between sort of the regularly visible and, and the sort of and, and the internet, if you like. I mean, how do you how did you find that that approach, and and how accessible was both rights to to it from the beginning? I mean, I I must say that from the outset, I'm not interested in um, how in his own personal psychological trauma because he's committed no, his no, heinous crimes at all. So he he killed 300 people mostly in close combat situations, right? So. And I think there's a statistic that if you kill 500, I don't know how they come to these statistics, but if you kill 500, you go insane or something. But, um, <laughs> so, so I'm more interested in what made him start to want to do this in the first place. Like what, what makes him believe that what he did, and he really believed what he was doing was a good thing to save the free world, so to speak. Um, and, and he comes in many different formations I think, now, right? Like, so, um, and then we see this with these kids who believe that they want to do something, they want to belong to something. And however much we might say, you know, but if they would only think, if it would be more critical, that no, we don't, because the, the way in which we grow up from the very beginning, with our kind of whole, all the information we've been fed through fiction, through narratives, like which are kind of social narratives of sociability, I think I would say, right? So we communicate with them, our imagination, our dreams, intuitions are somehow based on that concept. So for me, he had almost an obligation to participate. And then I interviewed a lot of people who are high, different kind of levels of high ranking. Um, intelligence operators for another project, and he was one. And there were 
in different kind of ways more or less secret about anything, even if there was Freedom of Information Act papers they had with me and said, you know, look, but you know, I know already about this, I can talk about it. They were like, groomed not to, um, oh yeah. Anyway, and he was very willing to talk. So in a way, yeah. he kind of felt, um, he felt alongside me, I guess. We had this relationship, where, or like this, this agreement, where I would say you have to, you know, in order to really, it, it won't redeem him anyway, right? Because there's no reason to redeem him apart from the people he killed, in a way. And, and there are numerous others, because he trained so many people to do the same kind of stuff. Um, but to actually really disclose something about the history, but not just in an expository way, but in a in a way to really find out how is this movement working between what he believed in, what he's done, and the kind of legacy and memory he gave to, to the new generation, I guess. Yeah, so it's, it's not really about the individual, it's a much bigger kind of thing I'm looking at, but I'm looking at through these kind of gaps, gaps in history I'm interested in, and gaps in knowledge, and, and also the gaps which we have between what we think we know and Let's let's come back at, you know, a bit later on to sort of how the, your film's intention and, and then its its outcome might have slightly different um, positions. It seems to me in relation to what what he's taken from the process. Um, but let's really zoom in now, if we could. Thank you very much for those really really good overviews. Um, can we zoom in on the actual process? You've got really compelling ideas, and now you need to fund them to make them you know really happen at the, at the, in the duration that you're. They're all features, so it's not just about making a short film. Emily. This was a collective action, as we said at the beginning, and you very quickly made the decision, I think, to collectively fund it, to reflect. Or was it more conventionally rooted initially? Yeah, I mean, my, my background is in television stuff, so I went to the National Film and Television School, I studied in documentary, and then for the last, like, ten years I've been making stuff for television, which is not to say that it's easy to get money, for the, you know, it was often quite touch and go, and, but I did manage mm -hmm. to come up with concepts and get funding from, mostly from Channel 4, but elsewhere a bit as well. Um, and so when I started doing, when I started filming for what became Just Do It, I think I imagined it would go down a relatively <coughs> kind of standard route. I'd go out, I'd shoot a bit of tape, I'd demonstrate what kind of access I could get, I'd go in and show it to them, and they'd go, yay, and I'd go commission, and then I'd be on my way. Um, you know, which had happened in the past, and was, you know, a relatively, standard kind of route. Um, but then once I sort of did, you know, once I did manage to kind of start getting the filming going and, and, and stuff, um, I found that, you know, for whatever reason, and I think partially it's timing and partially it's sort of small p politics and various, you know, for various reasons, um, there was just very little appetite for that film. The, the, the broadcasters were, you know, were interested in having conversations, but they essentially wanted a very tabloid version of the story. What I felt was not, you know, sort of in the name of objectivity, they wanted to make what I thought was an untrue portrait of what was going on there. Um, and, you know, I wanted to make what was a relatively sympathetic portrait because I saw no reason to tear these people down. I didn't see, you know, I didn't feel like that was doing any service to anybody. Um, other than maybe to the ratings of that channel and their tabloid column inches the next day, you know, which is really the deciding factor as far as anything goes inside broadcast decision making. Um, so, uh, you know, I suppose there was probably a period of a few months where I was sort of going and talking to people and trying to get them interested. And then, you know, relatively quickly, I realised that, the, that, you know, the film that I thought was the right film to make about the subject um, was going to struggle to get support from broadcaster and that that process of trying to work with them would, would quite quickly take the film in a direction that I wasn't prepared to take it in. Um, and it felt, like selling, it felt like selling out the people that had given me the access to it. It felt like I would have to do something that they would be unhappy with and that it would be very difficult for me to maintain the integrity of the project if I went ahead um, you know, with, with the sort of major broadcaster attached. Which then led to a kind of inevitability, okay, well if we're going to go ahead and we're going to do this film independently, you know, crowdfunding was just such an obvious match for the subject matter. Um, you know, so we then sort of began, 
it was actually, we didn't go into it straight away because I was still filming and we couldn't be very sort of massively public about what we were doing while I was filming. It had to be relatively sort of on the down low. Um, so, so I, you know, there was a period of time we just sort of stuck it out and then I think in February of the, of 2010, um, we started building the website to start crowdfunding and we thought it was going to take us three weeks and it took three months. Um, and that was like the first lesson we learned was just like don't bother to build it in on your own website, just use one of the platforms that's already out there. It may not be perfect, but it's going to save a lot of time. Um, so that, you know, so it just, and, and, and even then I think we, we were quite optimistic. I think in order to kind of go into doing this sort of thing, you have to be the sort of person that's a little bit willfully optimistic about things, or you know, you have a natural optimism. I think that we thought we'd raise more money quickly than we did. I think uh, you know we did very well, all, all told, but it was a lot more work than we thought, and it was not the great. You know, like I don't think it's a kind of seemed like it would be relatively straightforward. We had a large community already in support of the subject matter. We had a bit, but actually it was like pulling fucking tea. It was so hard. <laughs> um, and, and actually, as it happens, the real funding for the film that came from grants and from foundations. And quite possibly we wouldn't have gotten that money if we weren't also doing the other things that we were doing with the crowdfunding. And that was kind of a whole package and the whole kind of thing. Um, but a lot of the money that we got was relatively straightforward documentary funding um, that, you know, it's, it's hard to say. So unfortunately, although we tried really hard to be kind of anti-capitalist and our business model for it, in the end we relied quite heavily on rich individuals philanthropy, which I don't really like, but I'm glad that they were there to give us the money. Fantastic, thank you. Andrea, I mean, all, all three films you know, deal with time, both in the making, of course, and then the sense of duration in, in what they cover. You, you, you filmed Bogue Rights over, what, five years? And so a lot changed. Of course, the story changes just as with, with your film as well. The story changes as you film it. Um, how did you work with funding and, and other projects to, to even just be in the States for the duration of well, I, got, I got a, a grant, like a small grant to go for the first time. And at that time, I made a, I, I, the plan for the film was um, to have several people work both for Hollywood but also were mercenaries or covert operators. Um, so there was a, a found around the kind of Rambo nexus, quite a few people who did both which was interesting. Um, but then when I went back and I saw that I could actually get, get much more access to Bo, I wanted to make a film with him. And he seemed like in the kind of mainstream as very extremist and crazy. Um, and I'm also interested in that because he was part of the, one of the people who yeah, propagated that and then it came crashing down on him that kind of same way for the system. Um, but then I had more money because everybody said, no, but that's the film you proposed. And, Make it, and I was like, no, I can make a much better film. <laughs> and, um, and then I did a, yeah, I got HSC grant to, to, I wrote a research paper around those findings and the research which I was doing, and that funded a lot of the field work and friends. And it, it's unfundable if you're searching for to large degree, even regardless of how much stuff you've done in the documentary anyway, I think you have to have short cost of it. Mm -hmm. and, to, yeah. and then, um, and then I got quite a, a chunk of development funding from the Danish Film Institute, which was great. Um, but it also led me in a yet a different direction. <laughs> and, then, and then I knew, by the time of the end of that, I knew exactly what I needed to do. That's when I found the kid, and I was like, I, that's the film. Suddenly, I mean, I don't know if anyone who's a filmmaker, but you kind of know when, when you have the film, which you don't make. I mean, for me, it's always like that. Like, then I knew, and then, then I had to just convince people to come with me, and that was really difficult. But then I, yeah, in the end, I got a production company which funded it. Um, but nobody got paid. The editor worked with me for months and months. Nobody has been paid yet, so um, we haven't cleared any archive material. And it's really important, for instance, for me to clear ABC, CNN, to have the really high um, private, most expensive um, news channels, which are referring to. It's really important because if they say, look, that's the sky, he's rumble, how oh, great, it means something else. And if it's me, they're saying, oh, ABC is the same. So, I need to raise quite a lot of money, so, so anyway. <laughs> 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 Bucket of the door. Um, Can I just say something yeah, about the funding? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when my background is more in art, so activism, and in both cases, you're somehow used to either holding the rights to what you're producing or publishing under Creative Commons or whatever you like to do. And uh, Faceless was the first project, uh, which um, 
was uh, funded by a film production company, an Austrian based one. And what irritated me a lot, especially after <laughs> it was completed and uh, launched, was that this meant, this kind of co production meant that 50% of the rights and also of the income um, uh, yeah, went to this production company. So whenever Faceless gets screened and somebody's actually paying a fee for it, 50% continue going to this production company. Well, 47.5% <laughs> because 5% go to Tilda Swinton for her voice <laughs> um, But in any case, somehow, um, yeah, my practice uh, in terms of research is comparable to Andrea's and yeah, I mean, maybe using a sense that it really turns into a way of life. It's not like a commission you get from, I don't know, from a broadcaster and you work on it for three months and you get your fee as a director or whatever, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and this is why this model really doesn't work for me. Um, yeah, this kind of um, film production type of model, um, which treats my film like a product, basically. Can I say? Yeah, please. Yeah. I wanted to say two things actually, but one, I used to, um, I founded a company called Vision Machine Film Projects, which was working a lot in Southeast Asia, that's how I found him. And we, what we did when the globalization tapes was finished, so we, we got this big commission, and we did this um, deal with the, with the union, so whenever there's money coming in over the years, which it has been shown loads um, in all sorts of kind of different workers' rights environments all over the world, um, but that goes directly back to the people who participated with us on it. And I think that's kind of the model which, which, which I think is also interesting in working with activists, for instance, like how do we actually put stuff back into, into the kind of, um, to, to make it sustainable for people to participate and put something at risk in some way or another. I mean, I think these are, there's all these kind of different models which could be possible if there was a more um, visionary way of thinking about funding. Because I think sometimes we struggle so much to even get there <laughs> that we have to make all sorts of compromises with legal departments of production companies that just pick us up and then we haven't got the choice to do that which um, yeah, I really believe in strongly but with my last one I had to I, had, I, I will never make anything from it which doesn't matter because it was about the film mm -hmm. but I would have liked to have set up like a foundation for these kids and would, do you know like there's all this kind of other stuff which yeah. I don't inside it which I think is really important. I, mean, I think all three projects, of course, very clearly show that there's no single path towards making, I mean, even before the issue of paying oneself and the team. But clearly, you know, the bigger question behind this panel, and I guess behind the whole conference, I suppose, is how to live at the same time as, as engaging fully with rebellious or radical media practice. Because these are real questions, aren't they? If you're working for five years on a film, you know, um, certainly costs need to be met elsewhere. What's very interesting also um, from all of you is the relationship between funding uh, and it's sourcing from aspects of civil society and aspects of the state, but not necessarily some of the most obvious ones, or finding ways around the state, if you like, you know, in terms of BBC perhaps, or, or uh, certain aspects of AHRC funding against state funding, but, but through academic creativity and so on. Um, before we come on to the process of circulation, which is, again, so crucial to, to this discussion, could you each say something about the nature of the image culture we live in, if, if this is appropriate. Um, it seems to me that making an image now is very different from say even 10 or 15 years ago, moving image is still image. We are overwhelmed by image, and we are overwhelmed by images that almost immediately, even if they start out radically intended, are appropriated by commerce, by advertising, and so on. Um, it's a very nice um, twist on, on the title, with your memory, of course, that you take a certain phrasing that we all know elsewhere, and actually apply it in the reverse. But, but how do you think about the image? And, and it almost like, it's almost like constructing the image. What, what kind of image can be made that resists appropriation, it seems to me? Because that's at the bottom, if you like, the sort of bedrock. Maybe conceptual, maybe not so conceptual, maybe an actual bedrock. How, how, how can you make an image that not explicitly directly lifted and pirated, but its intention resists appropriation? Does that make sense? Is that yeah, but I, I don't know. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a, but, but you know, this issue comes up quite a lot in these yeah. sort of um, conversations about, well, I went out there and I did something really radical, and then this ad company came and they took it and they turned it into a commercial, and then they got it, you know. And I think it kind of cuts both ways because, like, on the one hand, you can sit there and kind of go, oh no, my radical message has been watered down and delivered to millions of people, or you could go, oh shit, my message got to millions of people, and it may not be, it may have been a bit watered down, but it reached reached a lot more people, and you're obviously having a massive effect on 
the kind of wider culture if if something you're doing gets picked up like that and you know gets kind of appropriated and 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 maybe it does also get some you know but I think it's I think it's a slightly silly game to kind of try and go can I create a, something that's so radical it cannot be appropriate and I was just like oh fuck just get on with it and create stuff yeah. that has really good meaning and pushes people to think in different ways and to kind of worry too much about like whether or not it's gonna, you know, get picked up and made more bland by the kind of, you know, mainstream corporate culture, or, or, you know, go, I, I just think is maybe a red herring or something. You know, like yeah, it happens. It's not necessarily a bad thing when it happens. Um, it, the more, you know, I, I personally like to, you know, I think we we need to be talking quite openly and honestly about how we see those things and what happens with them, and 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 trying. So it's the other side of it is. Don't, don't do their work for them and like kind of go, well, I really think this, but I'm going to like hold back and not really say what I really think in order to make my piece of work that I'm making more palatable to a wider audience or something like that. Well, then you get into this game of kind of doing the work for them because you're, you're kind of projecting out to another audience and going, well, I don't think you're quite ready for the real thing that I want to say, so I'm going to like hold back and just give you, you know, kind of piecemeal to you or something. Then I think you're, you're kind of, yeah, like I said, I think you're doing your, their work for them. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I think say what you really think and find ways of saying it is really the, the sort of main thing that you're doing. Mm. Mm, absolutely. And Andrea, in terms of the image making, I mean, it's, it's also the issue of, I guess, of what, you know, what literally is in the frame in terms of response to time, duration, the kind of culture that, you know, is based on acceleration constantly now. Um, and, and making a kind of, perhaps making a kind of image sequence that, um, Emily's very good points about, about cutting it both ways, but maybe there's, is there an image making that, not just in its visual, but in, almost in its, in its purpose, cannot be taken because it defies the landscape of the mass culture, particularly in relation to time, maybe. I think there is, um, I have two things to say about this. One is, um, I actually believe, like you're a little bit, it's a, it's a difficult question in terms, if you think about how, when it happened before, historically, not in the film, but like in, in writing, protest, um, montages and posters and whatever. Um, I think that there's, if you don't count, like, I think the most important thing for me, at least, is to find ways for each project that allow what I'm, what I'm trying to say to really, the complexity of what I'm trying to say to be brought across in the simplest of ways, and hopefully people will understand it. Like, for instance, the new film I'm doing is this very slow, they're, they're very long takes um, unfolding here, but it's also many. But I think this, this is a form which really fits the way I want people to look at something more considerately. Um, with this film, with the Rumble film, it's cut like an action film, it starts like an action film and then it kind of disintegrates and it becomes feverish and falls apart because I'm trying to make reference to that. But I have an other thing which I think we have to just talk about. You know, Max Clifford, when he did this, um, you know, he's the PR guru. And Mark Kennedy, the, the guy who was, um, you probably all know. So, so there were these people invited to pitch to make this film, the feature film about Mark Kennedy's um, infiltration. Everyone, incident. Mark Kennedy. Would you like to say just a bit? Just so Mark Kennedy is the guy who was infiltrating the um, police officer. Yeah, he was a police officer, and then for infiltrating a kind of uh, direct action network around Nottingham uh, for seven years, a yeah. deep undercover. Yeah. So they're making a there's a documentary being made, but also a fiction film, and the pitching forum was um, so whoever gets to make the documentary also gets to make the fiction. So the bigger question I have, I guess, for us is: so you make this film, and it will probably be seen your film or yeah. our, like my, you know, whatever outlets we'll have. But actually the film which probably will be releasing, unfortunately will be the big feature film about him. And he's paid, by the way, also twenty thousand pounds to participate in the documentary. And um, I don't know how much he's been paid for to put no, he doesn't have that. any relation to the fiction film. It's not the same company making like, that. No. But it's the same director. No. He what he was saying, are you really sure? Yeah. Okay, so well, there's two I, different there's one there's a fiction film being made by Michael Winterbottom that has no he has no uh, participation in, role. and then there's a documentary film ma being made by Brian Hill at Century Films that he, that was brokered by Max Clifford and he's... Okay, so then, then I take the fiction yeah. film away yeah. from now, because Michael Winterbottom is more complex than that, but still, like, to have somebody participate for £20,000 in a documentary, mm -hmm. um, that is, that is initi in initiated by a 
massive PR work. Mm. It's, a, it's another question that I think, who is going to get to see this stuff? Because it's already got general four broadcasting data touched it. So, um, and if it's successful, like how do we actually unravel even what we get to see? You know, how do we even, um, in the kind of more mainstream, this is what my interest is really in the kind of systemic, um, in the kind of systemic perpetration of a certain type of way of seeing that I find deeply troublesome. Which I'm not saying that all of the stuff which is shown into these bad is whole, right? Because we need those networks in order to disseminate the work. But I think there's a bigger question to be asked around how do we deal with it um, in terms of, I don't know, how do we, how do we get fed this stuff? Mm -hmm. And what does it actually mean?